Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Halifax International Security Forum in Nova Scotia, Canada, one of the world's leading gatherings of military, civilian, political, economic, and thought leaders from around the world. And we're honored to have with us Ambassador Kurt Volker, uh, one of the people who's got the toughest uh, job in the world right now. You're the special representative uh, to, to try to bring some form of peace uh, between uh, Russia and Ukraine. You were former uh, ambassador to NATO, uh, lifelong Foreign mm -hmm. Service uh, officer and continuing in that in that trend, and the executive director of the McCain Institute at Arizona State University. And I want to ask you about that great honor that Halifax paid mm -hmm. uh, that hopefully will be followed by other organizations as well for, for Senator McCain. Let me start off with uh, the toughest job in diplomacy now, okay. or one of them, which is trying to bring some manner of peace to the, the entire uh, Ukraine-Russia situation, obviously precipitated with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, seizure of Crimea, continuing provocations yeah. in Donbass. Bring us up to speed on where those negotiations are right now to try to at least stabilize the situation. Right. First off, this is still an active conflict. People shouldn't write this off as yesterday's issue or a frozen conflict. It's active fighting, ceasefire violations every night, people killed every week. So this does need a resolution. Uh, second, we've suggested to the Russians that uh, there be a robust peacekeeping force that goes in to establish peace, and that will create the conditions for the implementation of the Minsk agreements, which is what the Russians say they want. Uh, Russia has proposed something different. They proposed a protection force for the OSCE monitors that are there meant to monitor the ceasefire. That would still leave the armed groups in place, it would still leave the territory divided, it would not create the conditions in which you could hold elections successfully. So we're, we're skeptical that that approach that Russia has proposed is going to work. The US, UK, France, Germany, Ukraine, Sweden, Japan, everyone that's all on the Security Council except for Germany, everyone sees this pretty much the same way. You need a real peacekeeping force. That's what we're hoping we get those discussions toward. The thing for Russia is that by invading and occupying part of Ukraine, they've produced the opposite of what they want. They've produced a more unified, more nationalist, more Western-oriented Ukraine than ever existed before. So if they were hoping to get a Ukraine that is more compliant, that is more pro-Russian, they've, they've lost that. And now they're stuck with the costs of this ongoing operation, everything from sanctions to the actual military costs. And so it might be an area where we could actually agree. It's in their interest to get out. It's in our interest to see Ukraine get its territory back. Ukraine wants the territory back. So that's what we're trying to build on, is that there might be some common ground here. Uh, do you think that uh, all the parties are negotiating in good faith, as far as you're concerned at this point? Well, good faith meaning that they are uh, reflecting their position as to what they are seeking to achieve, and then doing their best to accomplish that as robustly as they can. Sure, that's what that's what anyone's going to do, that's what they're doing. I don't feel that there's been any deception or anything like that. Uh, it's just that it is very hard to navigate. Everyone wants certain advantages in this and we've got to try to keep the keep the issue focused at the strategic level. What are the key decisions that need to be made and if we agree on those, can we agree on the implementing steps? And what is it going to take to get Russia to exit, though, ultimately? It's under a lot of pressure because of the sanctions, but Vladimir Putin and the leadership continue to press ahead on whatever plan they have, continuing to pressure everybody. Uh, Zapata exercises that are not transparent, right? Everybody was focused on Belarus, but, but the, the nexus of the exercises were in different places, northern Sweden, where we recently visited. Um, talk to us a little bit about, you know, what's, what's it going to take to change Russia's vector? What does, do we know what Russia wants to change that vector? I'd say the first thing is that Russia has to conclude internally in its own thinking that what they're doing isn't worth it. It's not working, it's costing them a lot, it's not worth it, they don't need to continue. The second is that they need to be able to show that what they've done has been successful, that they've accomplished something. And that could be easily portrayed. It could be the special status for Eastern Ukraine, the fulfillment of the Minsk agreements, protection of Russian-speaking people, uh, even becoming a peacemaker in this Russia-Ukraine context. So they need to say that there's an accomplishment. And then finally, I think to recover a bit of respect for Russia internationally, I think is also important. And if a role as a peacemaker, a role in settling this generates that, I think that's also something Russia would be looking for. Will the world have to live with a divided Ukraine ultimately? Do you think that there's anything that will compel the Russians to actually give up that territory? Well, I think, if, again, if they recognize that it's not in their interest to hold it, uh, that it is not working for them, 
It is producing a more nationalist and Western-looking Ukraine. It is costing them a lot across the board, from their reputation to sanctions to international support for Ukraine to the cost to the civilian administration, the cost to the military operation. It's just not worth it. Uh, so if they come to that conclusion, that would be one part of it. And then the other is uh, if you know they still want to have a Ukraine that's in their sphere of influence. It's just that they are so effective at using other less costly means. You know, we've been talking at this conference about hybrid warfare, about information, about cyber, and all of those tools are, are available and being used by Russia. Holding this territory is actually counterproductive for them. Um, does the Malaysian jetliner that was shot down in 2014, does that play at all into any of these discussions? I think it's on the back of people's minds. Everyone knows what happened. The Russians deny that there was any Russian responsibility for it. All the investigations have pointed the other direction. I don't see any any new issue in this. I don't see any closure on this. It's just kind of in the background that people know this was a tragedy. It shouldn't have happened. And it is another reason why it's important to solve the conflict. Your broad diplomatic experience was one of the reasons why uh, the president tapped you for this job. But you were also a uh, U.S. ambassador to NATO where Russia is a front burner issue. Uh, and was was then as well when you were there uh, in the latter part of the Bush administration into the Obama earlier Obama administration. Um, do we fully understand what Russia's strategic plan is? They're they're building installations on borders. Uh, they're again conducting exercises. They're actively uh, using disinformation tools against all of our allies. You know, who would have thought that in Sweden there was like be a nuclear scare, but there was a nuclear exercise mm -hmm. recently where Sweden was targeted, and so now Swedes are talking about bomb shelters again. And you're fluent in Swedish, uh, and and served there. Talk to us a little bit about whether we in the West, as we're trying to deter Russia, fully appreciate what Russia's plans are and what it's trying to ultimately achieve. Uh, you know, is there something else they're trying to achieve that we might not fully understand? So my perspective on that, I don't think anyone has a um, crystal ball and can give you the answer to that question. My perspective on that is that Russia doesn't think of the question the way you asked it. Mm -hmm. There's not an end state that Russia is seeking to get to. Uh, Russia is instead uh, about having and exercising power, having and exercising influence, being treated as an important global player on all global issues that come up, having decisive influence in the former Soviet territories, having uh, a, a role as the, the, the homeland and the, the protector of all Russian people. These are all positional things, things that are important to Russia conceptually that don't necessarily have an end state. Uh, things can come and go, issues rise and fall, they can go in, they can get out. It's preserving those options for Russia as a long-term proposition, I think is really how I look at it. And do you feel at this point that they won't do something because there's always a nagging concern people have that he will try to grab some territory or, or pull some other action that will undermine NATO somehow, that, that the fabric of NATO, the idea of NATO, as a little bit the European Union has been undermined now? Well, I think that, um, again, positionally, Russia can then take individual decisions at any time. They, they position their militaries, they position their information, their media. They, they can then switch it on, switch it off, depending on what seems opportunistically relevant. What we are responsible for in NATO and in the West is dealing with our own decisions, our own posture, our own strength, our own decision-making about responses to things so that we create conditions that Russia can see and assess and make a realistic decision about. And that's where I think we've done very well, in fact, with the Baltic states, Poland, Romania, the forward deployments. Uh, we've conveyed to Russia that there is a high degree of multinational solidarity within NATO for the security of all these countries, and there is the likelihood of a direct military response should anything happen. Um, that's just a clear communication demonstrated by facts on the ground. And I believe as a result of that, Russia is not going to test that because it knows the consequences is not worth it. And that's what I think our job is, is to try to, to set things out in a practical and visible way that just inform Russian decision making. And then they'll make their own decisions. And, and let me ask you one last question. Uh, you're the uh, executive director, the founding executive director of the McCain Institute at Arizona State University. Uh, today, great honor, Peter uh, announced the award uh, for courage, the John McCain Award uh, for courage here at Halifax. 
impacts. Um, as as somebody who who works at who has worked very closely with the senator over many years, but also leads his namesake organization, what does that mean to you? And and what do you think John McCain means to international security at a delicate time? He couldn't join us this year because he's um, still recovering from his cancer treatment. Um, tell us what John McCain means to the international security community. I, I think he is hugely important. He plays an incredibly important role in the United States in demonstrating that U.S. values, American values, American interests, American governance goes on as people, you know, they, they see a lot of things in the media, they see a lot of things in our politics, but he's also a very steady force articulating our principles, our values, our interests as a country. Secondly, he makes the time and the effort uh, over decades to see people, to connect with issues, to stand for principles and solutions. And it's incredible whenever you travel, the number of people who come up to you who have a personal story of their engagement with Senator McCain in some ways had a tremendous impact in that. And I think this uh, prize that the Halifax Forum has created is fantastic because it is aimed at honoring other leaders around the world into the future for displaying those same attributes of courage, of leadership, of integrity that Senator McCain has always championed. And so I think it's a very fitting uh, award to be named for him. And it is looking forward rather than looking backward about what we're trying to incentivize in the world. And uh, talk to us a little bit about the, uh, the center and what you guys are working to accomplish. Well, that's also the ethos of the McCain Institute. We are created uh, to honor the legacy of Senator and Mrs. McCain and the McCain family going back generations. And we are focused on promoting character-driven leadership in the U.S. and around the world. And we also function as a do tank. We take on issues in humanitarian work, human rights, rule of law and governance, international security. And we try to see where we can make a direct difference on those issues. And so it's very much honoring that same action-oriented spirit and value driven spirit that the senator himself embodies. And, and in a transactional world, why is that so important? Uh, because values matter. You know, it is, yes, everybody can make a transaction, but what are we creating? What are we leaving behind? What's the bigger issue that is going to leave a better world? So a country like the United States, we are best off when we're in an environment that is respectful of freedom, of democracy, of human rights, of rule of law, of security. And if we can foster that kind of world, we do better as a country, our people do better, even individually, even with trade, even with jobs. So we need to be creating that kind of world. And I think that uh, that legacy of what Senator McCain has stood for, what the McCain Institute's trying to do, what the Halifax Forum is trying to do, is tremendously important because we've got to keep constantly trying to build and shape that world. Kurt, thanks so much Thank again. You. Really appreciate Good it. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks.